Father, the, the opportunity to study weekly is such a privilege. Thank you, Father. And the opportunity to study and teach every week is uh, an honor, and I thank you for that. And, Father, we are moving through this book almost to its end, in fact, just uh, looking at the last events of the last period of this age. And, Father, that is uh, in some ways something that's hard to imagine, hard to put our heads around. But, Father, in another way, it's really very close. So, Father, we ask that the night would be a preparation step for each of us in, in being ready to work in the final days of the final age, ready to do your will before you have come and your will is done in all things. And Lord, we ask that you'd give us the privilege of serving you just a little more, even as we wish you would come sooner. And Lord, help us to understand how we fit into this plan and how the plan itself is bringing us to the place you appointed. Lord, help us understand these things so that we can live according to them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends, we have uh, sorted out, for the most part anyway, the midpoint of tribulation, this middle time that we've studied now for a few weeks. And it is now ready, we're now ready to transition out of the middle, that is out of the midpoint of, of the seven years, into the final months and weeks of that period of time. And let's do a quick review of where the world stands at this point, uh, as it were if we were there. Uh, Satan has resurrected the Antichrist. Uh, he is indwelling the man's body. And by his power, the Antichrist is now ruling the world. He is celebrated as a Messiah or a savior of the world for having uh, apparently stopped all of the judgments, or so it seems. And in the course of this period of time, Satan has also raised up another man called the false prophet, and he now leads the world in worshiping the Antichrist as part of a new religion, a new world religion. And he put a supernatural image in the Jewish temple, which gives everyone a chance to focus their, their worship there when the Antichrist isn't in the room, which is most of the time. And the world... As they worship this new God, takes a mark ref reflecting or representing him. They have to have this mark if they're going to buy or sell, and if they don't, they're beheaded. And for the most part, the only ones who are resisting this world movement are those who either believe in Jesus or those who are Jewish and have remained devoted to Yahweh, and they aren't willing to bend their knee to another God. Among those groups, there is a subset of them, uh, Jewish believers in Petra, the rest are being persecuted wherever they exist in the world, especially in Jerusalem. Many are martyred, and if, if they are, they enter heaven, which is a blessing because they rest from the trials and they're prepared to enter into the kingdom in a resurrected form. Meanwhile, the rest of the world, they're enjoying a kind of uneasy peace right now. For the better part of the second half of tribulation, things seem to be going their way. There isn't any terrible calamities, at least at first. Uh, the world is under the rule of an antichrist who seems to have everything under his, his authority. And the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments have kind of come and gone. For the most part, there's still one remaining. But now in the second half of the tribulation period, we're just in a lull. And the next act in this drama is the release of the bowl judgments, which themselves collectively are the seventh trumpet. So we're waiting for that last trumpet to blow, the seven bowls to be poured out. So as we sit here at this point, having finished the mid-trib period, ready to move into the last half of tribulation, we've got the martyrdom of believers as a continuous truth through this time. And we have uh, relative peace for unbelievers as they go through this second half waiting for the end. And the Bible does not speak about that period very much. I mean, there's really nothing to talk about. We've already got the big picture. There's no meaningful event otherwise in that period. The next big event, the biggest event, really, is we're waiting for Christ's second coming. And he ends the age, he ends the seven years, as we know from Daniel. And then, right before that, and how far ahead of it is a little unclear, but weeks, maybe, days, weeks, not very long, the bold judgments begin. And as the bold judgments happen, they bring the world to the end with Christ. And that's what we're about to go study. So in the book of Revelation, the, the storyline, the narrative, jumps effectively from mid-trib to that very last part of the second half. Because I said, there's nothing really going on between them. That is nothing we don't already know. So we're now moving to chapter 15. Tra chapter 15, like chapter 11 was at the other end of the mid-trib period, it's a transition. It moves us out of the mid-trib discussion and back into the flow of the judgments. And so we start there in chapter 15. Let's go 
Oh, guys, sorry if you can hit play again, my fault. Let's go to chapter 15, we'll go to verse one. And I'm gonna have to back up here, or forward back to where I was. And you can get to see that again, because it was kind of cool. 15.1, it says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. So John in heaven gets directed once more to witness something. It's called a sign, a symbol. And in fact, all of chapter 15 is a sign. The sign begins with seven angels holding seven bowls. John says that these are the last. What he means, of course, is these are the last judgments of tribulation. But more than that, these are the last of God's judgments as required under the Old Covenant. Do you remember under the... Uh, teaching we did already, that the period of tribulation itself, the whole seven years of it, is a consequence of the terms of the old covenant that was established between the Lord and Israel. So that all that's happening in these seven years are appointed for Israel in keeping with the terms of the old covenant. That's what Daniel was told. Remember when Daniel was told about this period of the age of the Gentiles and of the 70 periods of seven years that would be designated for Israel's judgment. When he was told about all of that, he was told that this period had been decreed for your people, for Israel, and for your city, Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to finish the transgression, of course, refers to their transgressing the old covenant. So we're going to put an end to their transgression of the old covenant. We're going to make an end of their sin. They won't have sin anymore. We're going to make an atonement for the iniquity that they uh, demonstrated. And it will usher in everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy, and then anoint a new temple, the most holy place. All of these are the outcomes of this period of time called the age of the Gentiles. Well, until the period is over, that is until the 70th seven has played out, these can't come to pass. These are the result of 77s, and we've gone through 69 of them. Now we're in the middle of the, se- the final one, the 70th of it. When it's all said and done, this will have been accomplished. So in that sense, this is the wrath of God being finished for the sake of Israel and for the sake of the covenant. So God is uh, obligated uh, to pour out wrath on Israel because of the terms of the covenant, and he has to complete that wrath through these seven judgments. Now, these seven judgments are not directed at the believer. And we've studied this already, but this is not a series of judgments. This is one of the reasons why we know that the removal of the church from the earth doesn't wait until some moment during the seven years because if that were to happen, it's directly contradictory to the whole purpose of the seven years. The seven years are not appointed to the church, they're appointed to Israel and to unbelieving Israel, which is why we've already seen the believing remnant be set aside in Basra for a period of time, so they're protected. This is, again, in keeping with the principle. These judgments are not for the believer. They're for the unbeliever. So, Unbelieving Jews and the rest of the world are experiencing this, but the good effect of it, the purpose of it, is ultimately for Israel. So Zechariah gives us a good example of that. I'm, just going to re- I'm reviewing this because of what we're going to see as we get into the text. But in Zechariah 13.7, Israel is told, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man, my associate, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. It will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but the third will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested, and they will call on my name, and I will answer them, and I will say they are my people, and they will say the Lord is my God. All right, so this testing of Israel, the third that's left in the land, produces in them ultimately a salvation that brings them to God at the end. All right, so what we're watching here take place in the remainder of tribulation is the Lord narrowing his focus on the unbelieving Jew who still exists on the earth in that time such that he can complete the purpose he set forth in these things, which is to bring Israel back to himself. And he delivers the judgment in that way after having delayed it for a very long time. Isaiah says this in Isaiah 48, 8, You have not heard, you have not known, even from the long ago your ear has not been opened, because I knew that you would deal very treacherously, and you have been called a rebel from birth. For the sake of my name, 
I delay my wrath, and for my praise I restrain it for you, in order not to cut you off. Behold, advance, there we go. Um, oh, sorry. He says, Behold, I refine you not as silver, I have tested you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake. For my own sake I will act. For how can my name be profaned and my glory I will not give to another? Listen to me, O Jacob, even Israel, whom I've called. I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. So that's a, an indication from Old Testament, from Isaiah, of how the Lord has been saying to Israel from long ago, uh, I have this purpose to refine you, to bring you back, to test you in a furnace of affliction. That's a, a reference to tribulation. And he's now fulfilling that. All right, so let's get back to chapter 15. But what you need to understand is 15 is starting to talk about the need for God to put these things into action to accomplish the plan he set forth. Back to 15, verse 2. And John says, I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire and those who have been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of the glass holding harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. All right, this is still part of the sign, and it has multiple parts, and it starts with the sea of glass mixed with fire. Now, sea, glass, and fire typically don't mix, uh, not well. So you have to imagine John is seeing something here that he's having trouble describing, and he doesn't have a very good point of reference, so he's just drawing on things he knows, and he tries to describe it as best he can. Clearly, though, he's seeing something otherworldly. So standing on this sea, as he calls it, are those who have been victorious, he says, over the beast, which obviously is a reference to the Antichrist, but in this context, to have been in that location, that is in the heavenly throne room, and to be called victorious means they've been martyred. So death here is called a victory over the beast, over his image, over the number of his name. And how then is death a victory? Certainly not the way the world would think of it, right? They would think that if you've been killed, you've lost. It's a victory here, first, because it removes the person from the influence of the beast and it brings them to a place of rest. That much is not hard to understand. But it also means that once a saint dies in this period of history, they pass from the dominion of the enemy, remember he's bound to earth now, he can't go back and forth anymore, so they have passed from the dominion of the enemy to the dominion of the Lord. And here's the key, since they have left the world behind, they are no longer within the reach of the enemy, they have overcome him in that sense, and they've overcome the mark in the sense that they never gave in to the demands to worship him or to take the mark, and now that they're free from the earth, they'll never have to worry about doing that, or about being made to do that. So they have... The time, they've run out the clock so that now the game is over. They don't have to worry anymore. They've died without giving in to the enemy's demands, and in that sense, they've passed a test of sorts, and they've overcome the enemy. It says that they never loved their physical life more than they loved the Lord. And that is exactly the kind of eternal perspective that every believer is supposed to maintain, right? That, as Jesus said, the one who seeks to gain his life will lose it. The one who loses his life will gain it, speaking about this trade-off. All right, next... In the sign, you see tribulation saints singing with harps the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Now, these are two different songs that are being sung in that place. The song of Moses first, then the song of the Lamb. Now, the song of the Lamb is given to us here because it doesn't exist anywhere else. We've never heard of it before. So here in verses 3 and 4, you see the song of the Lamb being given to us. But they don't give us the song of Moses here because it's given to us elsewhere in the Bible. Uh, so uh, let's talk about the lamb first because it's the one we have in front of us. Uh, we know this is a praise to Christ, and of course we know that because though his name is not mentioned, we know the lamb is Jesus. And the singers here declare Jesus is the righteous king of the nations, that he will soon be the one worshipped by all nations. And the point is obvious that we're at a time now where tribulation is coming rapidly to its end, and that means Jesus' second coming is soon to happen, and at that the kingdom will soon appear. And so the singing of the Song of the Lamb is simply to emphasize we're just about ready for everything we've been waiting for for all this time. And then secondly, the singers are singing a Song of Moses. Now there are two possible songs that are being sung when we think of the Song of Moses. Let me take you to the first. The first is uh, possibly from Deuteronomy. 
32. And let me just take a part of it. It's a long song. Let me just grab some pieces of it for you. So starting in 32, verse 5, they have acted corruptly toward him. They are not his children because of their defect, but are a perverse and crooked generation. Do you thus repay the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is not he your father who has bought you? He has made you and established you. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of all generations. Ask your father. He will inform you. Your elder, they will tell you. They sacrificed to demons who were not God, to gods whom they have not known, new gods who came lately, whom your fathers did not dread. You neglected the rock who begot you and forgot the God who gave you birth. Vengeance is mine, and retribution in due time their foot will slip. For the day of their calamity is near, and the impending things are hastening upon them. For the Lord will vindicate his people and will have compassion on his servants when he sees that their strength is gone and there is none remaining bond or free. And he will say, where are their gods? The rock in which they sought refuge. If I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand takes hold on justice, I will render vengeance on my, enemy, on my adversaries and I will repay those who hate me. That's a pretty good sample of what's in that, song, uh, in that song from Deuteronomy 32. It's speaking here about the nation of Israel, obviously. It, it comes at a point when Moses is about to die, and the nation's about to enter the promised land without him. And as he's at that point, he warns the nation that the Lord will deal in vengeance with them for their sin, and that a future Israel will become faithless, and they'll worship other gods, and they'll overlook the rock who saved them. And so the Lord will bring calamities upon them. He will bring them to the point where they see their strength gone, where they're broken. And, and in bringing them to that low point, breaking their rebellious hearts, he ultimately puts them in a position where he can restore them. But that's, that's the, the heart of this song in Deuteronomy 32 is that of God dealing with a rebellious people by putting them through the ringer. You know, there's some kids that you cannot d get through to except through the strongest of discipline. They're just not gonna take anything less than the hardest thing you can give them. And Israel was basically, you know, millions of people of that type, stiff-necked. The, the phrase in Hebrew is a euphemism. It simply refers to not being willing to bow your head to God, stiff-necked. So that was the Israel of that time. And this song, if it's one of the ones being sung in heaven now, it's clearly prophetic because ultimately the fulfillment of it is found in the events of tribulation. There have been minor versions of this in times past, but the ultimate, final effort of God to break the, the yoke of Israel and to get them in to, to obey is the tribulation events because it brings Israel out in a glorified, sinless form. Now, if you remember, the, the relationship between Israel and, and the Lord is based on covenants. The first of those with Abraham was without condition, but the second of those, the Mosaic covenant, which came alongside the first... That one has conditions, and Israel's disobedience to that covenant required, according to its terms, that God pour out judgment against that nation for those sins, according to the terms of the, of the agreement. And though there have been periods of history in the past when the Lord has brought versions of judgment, like when they were sent into Babylon and so on, we learned already from our study of Daniel that the age of the Gentiles, starting with Nebuchadnezzar and finishing here with these seven years, this is the period of time that ultimately accomplishes all of that judgment for Israel. So the first song of Moses is one that reminds Israel of why they're going through what they're going through. And then the second song of Moses is in Exodus 15. It's at the point where Moses has just led the people of Israel through the Red Sea and the sea has just closed down on the uh, Pharaoh's army so that they're wiped out and here's Israel now standing in Midian free of their enemy and and having seen this take place and then Moses and the people break out in this song the enemy said I will pursue I will overtake I will divide the spoil my desire shall be gratified against them I will draw out my sword my hand will destroy them you blew with your wind and the sea covered them they sank like lead in the mighty waters who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. In your loving kindness, you have led your people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you have guided them to your holy habitation. Terror and dread fall upon them. By the greatness of your arm, they are motionless as stone until your people pass over, O Lord, until the people pass over whom you have purchased 
You will bring them and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. All right, now you see another picture in that, don't you? That, in other words, that discussion of the Red Sea experience could just as easily be a, a discussion of what they're going to experience in tribulation. That the parallels are intentional. In Egypt, you, or in the Exodus story, you had an Israel escaping a slavery by fleeing into the desert from a determined enemy. And ultimately, through a series of miraculous judgments, the Lord brings them to himself, dwelling in safety in the promised land. Well, you have exactly the same set of circumstances here. In effect, Israel escaping a slavery to sin, fleeing into the desert, Petra being the example there, a determined enemy, Satan and the Antichrist, miraculous judgments ultimately bringing Israel back into the bond of the covenant and into the kingdom, which is the ultimate fulfillment of the promised land. One is just a giant picture of the other. So you have a heavenly choir, and they're singing the song of Moses, which I would argue would probably include elements of both of these songs, because both are relevant. On the one hand, the Lord is fulfilling his promise to bring vengeance and judgment. On the other hand, he will rescue his people in the end. And the next few chapters of Revelation explain how he does that. So let's make sense of this scene by understanding how these songs are a sign. You have a heavenly scene, it's communicating something about what's going to happen at the end of tribulation, communicating it through these songs. The first of those songs is sung about Jesus, which would indicate it's a song being sung as a sign to the believers who are still on earth during this time. And that song is communicating to the believer that Christ's return is imminent, that his time of rule is near, that he alone is righteous, he alone is holy, in contrast to the blasphemous claims of the enemy, and they just need to hold out a little longer their reward is almost there. And that sign from heaven, and the suggestion here would be that those on heaven, on earth, are going to see this or hear it, that's going to give the believer in tribulation something to cling to as they face the terrible persecution that will dominate in that second half of the seven years. It's probably going to feel like, in that time, something like what it did when the Christians of Rome were being fed to lions, when you know, the enemy will be tearing families apart, executing children in, in front of their parents, uh, wives in front of their husbands, uh, and probably carrying out even greater atrocities than we can imagine. And in that m situation, a believer's confidence lies in the knowledge that they overcome through death and that the return of Christ is momentarily about to happen and they don't have to hold out much longer. But the Song of Moses, in the second case, both the first kind of the, the, the first half and the second half of the Song of Moses, that's communicating to a completely different group of people. Moses' song, I believe, is being sung to the Jews of tribulation, particularly to the Orthodox, unbelieving Jews of that day. The first part of that song from Deuteronomy, reminding them that you're in the middle of all these circumstances because of your old covenant. And that's a very interesting sign when you think about it. That, in other words, they can take confidence and some kind of relief or comfort in the fact that their God is still on the throne working according to the terms of a covenant that they signed with him thousands and thousands of years ago. So they can get the point that our nation is atoning for something. Our nation is going through something he promised. And so ironically, the, la the, the, the way the world has gone to hell in a handbasket is proof to them that God is still in control because it's in a keeping with the covenant. And as such, his promises have not been broken. So it's another way of saying if he's going to keep all the bad promises, he's also going to keep all the good promises too. And for the same reason, I think the second song of Moses is also speaking to these people as a sign. Even when things looked darkest for Israel, they had their backs up to the Red Sea, God found a way to, to save them. And in the middle of tribulation, when the Jews are at the end of their rope, they're going to remember God has said that Moses' song is relevant to this set of circumstances. And later in our study, you're going to see how the Lord does a miraculous rescue with their backs against the wall. All right, so the sign of chapter 15 is to, to two different persecuted groups in the second half of tribulation. That's what makes 15 a transition chapter. Believers are told to look forward to the Lord's coming and reigning. The Orthodox Jew is told to look forward to the Lord's rescue for his people, and they're meant to be encouragements to hold on. We're almost near the end. And then we get to verse 5. He says, After these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. All right, now the next part of this sign transitions to the temple. 
in heaven and to the opening of a tabernacle in heaven. Now, in the heavenly realm right now stands a tabernacle. It is, we assume, similar to the one that Moses was instructed to build for Israel in, in the law because the writer of Hebrews tells us that the earthly tabernacle was patterned on the one that's in heaven. In Hebrews 9.23 it says, It was necessary for the copies of the things in heaven to be cleansed with these, with blood of animals, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. You see how the writer keeps calling the one on earth a copy? It's a copy of something in heaven. And elsewhere in the, in the law itself, it's called a pattern. It's, been, it's based on a pattern. The one on earth is based on a pattern. So, in the tabernacle we know that he gave Moses on earth, you had a multi-chambered building, and in the smallest room, the back, the, the holy place, the holy of holies, we call it, there was a ark. And the ark had a lid on it, which we call the mercy seat. <clears throat> and on the mercy seat is where the, the glory of God would appear. So we assume that there is a tabernacle in heaven with a mercy seat in heaven. And Ezekiel 28 tells us that Satan's original job was to guard the mercy seat in the heavenly tabernacle. He was one of the cherubs whose wings were over the mercy seat in heaven. And the Shekinah glory of God dwells on the one on earth, and we must assume it's also dwelling at the one, in the one in heaven. But at a point in Israel's history, specifically in 605 B.C., right before Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed the temple, the glory of the Lord left the temple. That's in, you can see that in Ezekiel as well. And it left because God was about to let Nebuchadnezzar destroy the building. And he wasn't going to be there, of course, when that happened. So the, the Shekinah glory of God exits the building, and we're, Ezekiel sees this and describes it to us. Shortly thereafter, Nebuchadnezzar wiped it out, and with that starts the age of the Gentiles. And for the entire period of the age of the Gentiles, God's glory has never returned to the temple because we are in the age of Gentiles. The next time that the glory of God will appear in a temple on earth is at the outset of the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. Why? Because that will be a new age, not the age of Gentiles, but the age of a Jewish king. It will be the age of Israel again. So with the return of Jesus and the establishment of the kingdom, God's glory will re-inhabit a building on earth once again. And for those who've been in the Ezekiel study with me, you'll remember that that's where Jesus lives for the entire thousand years, in the Holy of Holies, never to leave that place. And we'll study that a little more when we look at chapter 20. So as the Lord now prepares to throw the final bits of wrath on the earth, the bold judgments, and bring the seven years to an end, right before that happens, he opens the tabernacle in heaven as a sign, whether it's visible from earth or not, I'm not sure, but John sees it. And the glory of the Lord on the mercy seat in the heavenly tabernacle becomes visible for a time. What do you think that says? What's the message to particularly Israel who hasn't seen the glory of the Lord since 605 B.C.? It's a way of saying my return to my household is about to happen. I'm coming back. Here's what Ezekiel says of the day yet to come for us even when the glory of the Lord enters his house again. In Ezekiel 43, describing this scene Ezekiel says, And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Then I heard one speaking to me from the house while a man was standing beside me. And he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell among the sons of Israel forever. And the house of Israel will not again defile my holy name, nor, uh, neither they nor their kings, by their harlotry and by the corpses of their kings when they die, by setting their threshold by my threshold and their doorpost by my doorpost, with only the wall between me and them. And they have defiled my holy name by their abominations which they, which they have committed, so I have consumed them in my anger. Now let them put away their harlotry and the corpses of their kings far from me, and I will dwell among them forever. All right, so that's, that's what we're leading toward. This scene in chapter 15 is a bit of a preview. And the next part of the sign communicates that the time for the Lord to finish with wrath and to return to dwelling with Israel has come. And so with that, now angels emerge with bowls of final judgment. It says, And seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple, clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their chests with golden sashes. 
Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. All right, so now we're getting into the last judgment. You can see 15 is just teeing us up for where we're going. And the seventh trumpet judgment, which as you remember, is now these seven bowls, is about to, to be fulfilled. We heard the trumpet blown earlier in an earlier passage, but now we're waiting to see it all play out. Here it begins. And the bowls have been handed to the angels. Now, wrath, uh, God's wrath, is commonly depicted in the Bible as something that can be poured out, obviously figuratively speaking. But you can find examples of this everywhere, examples of a cup of pouring out being a description of wrath, or someone drinking a cup of wrath, so you know, being drowned in it, so to speak. And that likewise, God's wrath can be stored up. You can fill up a cup with God's wrath, so to speak. And now you see wrath measured here, not in cups, but for the first time in scripture, bowls. All right, indicating you have a greater form of judgment here. Israel has stored up for herself, not cups of wrath, but bowls of wrath. And it's going to be poured out in full measure. Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 5, Because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. Now, believer, this is what we've been saved from. All that wrath that you had stored up has been poured out on Christ, right? That's the, that's the gospel. But, but it is interesting to see that there is a, a, a quantum a measuring of wrath. I don't believe this is entirely euphemistic. It's figuratively written, but I don't believe it's uh, entirely euphemistic in its meaning. I believe there is more wrath for some than for others, which is the indication here. And then, back to 15, there's an interesting moment in chapter 15. It says, And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. All right, so the temple in heaven is filled with the smoke that represents his glory and the power of the Lord, and then everyone, it says, is barred from entry into the temple. Now, ask yourself this, who normally enters the temple of God? And in the case of Israel, it was, under the law, it was the priests, right? They were the only ones who could enter. And in, in the case of the Holy of Holies, only the high priest could enter. So if we assume that the heavenly tabernacle is operating under similar principles, remember, the one on earth was patterned after it, after all, then we must conclude that when it says no one may enter the temple, what it says is no priest will enter the temple. And what priests are in heaven? Well, there's only one that we know of, Christ, the high priest, right? So the indication is that the Father has barred Jesus from entering the temple until after the seven bold judgments. Now I ask yourself this, if Jesus can't enter the temple, then he cannot go before the Father for intercession. And if he cannot make intercession then there can be no grace. Which is to say, this is a further indication that during this last part of the seven years, it is not possible for new faith on the earth. It is not possible for salvation. There is no intercession available at this point. Back to what we said in weeks past, once you move past mid-trib, you have the mark, you're done. You don't have the mark, you're persecuted, but there's no new people joining one or the other group. You're, everyone picks a side at the beginning and you're set for three and a half years. So, Chapter 15 is a transition chapter. It leads us out of mid-trib. So technically, as we get out of chapter 15, we're still at about the mid-trib point. We're just leaving that scene. So the indication here is that as you enter into the second half of tribulation, the bold judgments are poised, and Jesus is outside the temple for that period of time. And now as the bold judgments start, which is near the end of that three and a half years, the, thing, the, the, the pace moves rapidly we come through this in a fairly short period of time. Again, based on what we'll study, I would argue it's probably no more than a matter of a few weeks. All right, now at the end of chapter 15, we officially have done the mid-trip part of this study. Now we start with chapter 16, and with chapter 16, we're gonna continue to build our understanding of how we get to the end of the seven years. There, just like with mid-trip, as you get to the end of tribulation, a lot is happening. The sequence is tough to follow because the chapters keep talking about similar things that are all happening at the same time. So we have to understand the cause and effect. We have to build a sequence. You're going to get lots of charts. It's all going to be laid out. So in some ways, the end of this seven-year period is similarly complex to the middle because as the bold judgments are poured out, a bunch of stuff happens. All right. Let's start with the first five 
of the bold judgments. Chapter 16, verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood like that of a dead man, and everything in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of waters, and they became blood. And I heard an angel of the waters saying, Righteous are you who are and who were, O holy one, because you judge these things. For they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. Then I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of pain. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. All right, so the final wrath of God is poured out. And with it, we get a new level of suffering and misery. Now, before we look at each of them, just note here how often we see this repeating pattern that the judgments are limited to those who are not of the Lord. It's the ones who have the mark that get the sores. It's the ones who are of the enemy's kingdom who are in the darkness. An exact parallel to what you see in the Egyptian plagues in which the nation of Israel set aside in Goshen was accepted, you know, not included in those judgments. The Lord, as James tells us, knows how to distinguish or differentiate between those who are under judgment and those who are not. He is not indiscriminate. And as a result, it's more proof to add to what we've already studied that you do not have to think that someone's going to enter into the tribulation, much less any of us, because the whole thing is meant to be some kind of last series of disciplinary moves on God's part. That's not what this is about. This is wrath poured out. It's wrath poured out against people who don't know him for a good purpose in the end. But we're not there. All right, so let's go through each of these. First, you have a bowl that results in a physical outcome of loathsome, loathsome sores. Loathsome sores. Uh, the word loathsome is from a Greek word that means wretched and malignant. It's literally the word for evil or wicked. So if these sores are vile and wicked, that must mean that they disrupt the flesh in some kind of unimaginable way. You might even... Uh, Imagine the way Jesus' own body was ripped to shreds by the scourging. This might be doing something similar to the bodies of, of humanity. And then we have the second bowl. God puts an end to all sea life by making all seas turn to blood. Now, uh, besides an uncountable number of dead and rotting fish, and we're talking about seas after all, the blood itself would begin to congeal and putrefy and and that's going to shut down the water cycle of the planet if it's even still been going on at all, right? Stopping all rain. And you have this unimaginable environmental disaster. But you also have the, the impossibility of sea navigation now. So that's now, that, that comes back later. Uh, then you have a third bowl now making freshwater sources also turn to blood. Obviously, the angel explains these are as a repayment for what's been done to the saints, pouring out the blood of saints. And I love that phrase, they deserve it. Um, now, this judgment is one of the indications we have that I would point to as support for saying that the bold judgments happen at the very end of the seven years. As, as some might imagine these, they would tell you that they're kind of sprinkled across the three and a half years, but I think that really is inaccurate for a number of reasons, but here's one of them. How long can someone survive without water to drink? I mean, a few days, right? Now, maybe the world stockpiled a little bit of water in some places and they can survive for a time. But look, they were not about three and a half years. You can't go three and a half years on the planet with no fresh or salt water, right? So this is a, at a point where things rapidly move to an end. And then fourth, you have the sun increasing in intensity to the point that it burns men. Now imagine living with this. Imagine living with evil, wretched sores in a world with no rain, and no fresh sources of water whatsoever. And now on top of that, the earth is scorching you with tongues of fire. And, and people are being scorched by the, by the heat of the, uh, of the sun. And that heat, by the way, would also rapidly increase the decomposition of the blood and all the dead animals that are now around. I mean, the air in the, the, of the earth must be wretched at this point, right? So 
you have that taking place. And then fifth, you have bowl, the fifth bowl judgment is darkness. And that darkness is so intense that it causes unbearable pain. Now, how does darkness create pain? Well, the answer is it's not merely the lack of physical light here. This is a spiritual darkness. In other words, it's similar to the way the Father withdrew His presence from Jesus while Jesus hung on the cross. And in the way that the Father and the Son became separated, which is the second death, in that, that, you know, Jesus died the second death before He died the first death. He died His second death on the cross, and then He died the first death of the body after that, which, by the way, is exactly what Adam did. He was the second Adam. Adam died spiritually first, and then he died physically later. So Christ died spiritually first in the sense that he was separated from the Father. That's what spiritual death means. It doesn't mean cessation of existence. It means separation from the Father. So when Jesus says, My Lord, why have you for, uh, for, for, uh, forsak, forsaken me? Sorry, I can't talk all of a sudden. My Father, why have you forsaken me? He was saying, where did you go? First time in all of eternity that Jesus and the Father weren't one. And that was the second death on the cross. Then when the second death had been completed and light returned, he says it is finished. So the work of redemption was finished at his death on the cross. The darkness, though, that came upon the earth for the three hours that he was separated was a darkness of God having withdrawn his presence from creation. That's the whole idea of being withdrawn. And in this case, as the creator separates himself from the creation for this period of darkness... It means that what is there is left to the mercy of the spiritual forces of darkness. So for a time, the world feels the effect of the Lord's wrath by an absence of his protection, of the, the absence of his common grace. Now look, there's a pattern that you follow in these five that start to tell you what he's attempting to do here. You have scorching heat. Think of, see if this doesn't ring any bells. Scorching heat, darkness, no water, no refreshment, at the mercy of the enemy, and no physical relief from torment you're experiencing a preview of hell. And it's because it's under the same conditions as hell. What is hell? Hell is a place that experiences continually the outpouring of God's wrath. What is this? This is an outpouring of God's wrath, producing the same effect on earth for a time. And it makes sense then that, they would, that the outpouring of God's wrath would be felt in similar ways. Heat, darkness, the lack of his counsel or presence, etc. And what is the world's response to all of these calamities? Well, in verse 9, they continue to blaspheme. And the reason they continue to blaspheme and they will not repent is that they cannot do so, no one can do so apart from the grace of God. There is no, there is no actor, no catalyst moving their hearts to God. All they can do is be who they are. And what does an evil, desperately wicked heart do? This. And no amount of tragedy, no amount of pressure, pain, or otherwise is going to convert someone. What is it that brings us to repentance? The kindness of the Lord, not the severity of our punishment. So an unbeliever's sin nature, it's eternal. And so the rebellious behavior of, a belie of an unbeliever is also eternal. And for the same reason, an unbeliever's punishment must be eternal. Nothing's changing it. It just keeps going, so the conditions keep going. And these judgments are reinforcing the sign of what we saw at the beginning of chapter 15 in the Song of Moses. That is, in the Exodus, the nation of Israel was held captive by Egypt, and the Lord used judgments to free his people. Here again, you have Israel being captive to an enemy, both in the sense literally of the Antichrist, but also in the sense of their own sin. And the Lord is pouring out judgment as a precursor to freeing his people. And if you look at the bowls themselves, one, two, three, and five, all have direct parallels to judgments that take place during the Exodus. So there's an intentional connection here to remind us that these judgments have as their ultimate purpose a freeing of Israel, not the destruction of Israel. And yet there is a ton of collateral damage in the process. And chief among them is Israel's enemy being laid waste, which is what you see here. All right, so now we've studied the first five bowls. Let's pause to look at how those bowls fit into the overall plan for the end of tribulation. Because you're sitting here thinking, well, we've we got a lot of book left, and we just did five of the last seven judgments. What's going on here? Well, because the first five are, are really just setting the backdrop, setting the stage for what's now going to start to happen. These first five are a systematic delivery of hell to earth in preparation for the Lord's return. And as such, they're called the plagues. Uh, actually, in the, in the text we read, all seven are called plagues. So all seven are technically plagues. But 
I'm going to make a, 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 a bit of an audible here. I'm going to make my own call on this. That is, I'm not contradicting the scripture, obviously, but I'm saying in the way I'm going to teach it, I'm going to call the first five plagues because they stand apart from the last two in a dr- very distinct way, keeping in mind that the scripture says they're all plagues. But the first five, I'm calling plagues in a different sense. They are these disasters that bring hell to earth. And they're an outpouring of God's wrath. They are also a preparation, though, for what's going to happen in the next two chapters. In chapters, actually the next three. 17, 18, and 19. The last two judgments, uh, when you look at what they actually accomplish, may seem very insignificant compared to the ones we just looked at. But they are part of a larger set of events. And uh, they climax in something called the War of Armageddon. That war has multiple stages. And the war ends at the end of tribulation and at the moment of Christ's second coming. So the first two stages of the war, of this five-stage war, are set in motion by the final two bold judgments. So what we're looking at now as we move out of the five and into the last two is a series of complex movements on earth as part of a larger war where God himself is, is establishing or moving this war along by these judgments that present the need for them. And in fact, the first five are the reason the war starts. And then the sixth and the seventh are God's way of directing the war in a certain way. Okay? Let's talk about the war for a second. You know, even just the use of the word Armageddon will trigger usually a, a wide variety of misconceptions and assumptions about what that is. Some think it's already happened, some think it's going to happen in our day, some people don't even understand it at all. Most have heard of it, but like most war, the events of this war are complex and they defy a simple explanation. You could write a whole book on it, and some have. Uh, let's begin with the fact that the War of Armageddon is not a single camp, uh, military engagement, it's not a single moment. It's a series of campaigns over a series of days or weeks. It uh, takes place in a series of locations. It involves many different groups and characters. And as usual, Revelation is going to give us a broad outline on these things, but you have to go to the Old Testament to get the detail. That's part of what we'll be doing in the coming weeks. But even more confusing than that, the descriptions of the war and the events of this war are sprinkled throughout chapters 16 through 19. And... Here's how they relate. The War of Armageddon generally is described by the sixth and seventh bold judgments and the activity of chapter 19, which leads us into Christ's second coming, plus Old Testament texts that give us the detail. But chapter 16 is talking about events that set up the whole of the war. Chapter 17 is talking only about the events of that last judgment. Chapter 18 goes back to talk about things that were going on when the earlier judgments were happening. And chapter 19 is talking about the very last stages of the war. So knowing that is important to putting the whole battle plan together. Now we're going to have maps, we're going to have little tanks moving around on maps, we're going to have all kinds of stuff. You're going to figure it out with me, it's not that hard, but once you see it. But we have to do this in stages, that's why we have a lot left to do even though we're at the end of the quote judgments. We're going to dissect all this in the coming weeks. First, let's establish for tonight the relationship between the bowls and the opening events of the war. And we're going to begin where we left off in Revelation 16 at the sixth judgment. Okay? Verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gather them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Har Megiddo. All right, so as the sixth angel pours out his bowl, we're told that the effect of this bowl is, drum roll, a river dries up. Well, the river here is the Euphrates. It's the major river of Mesopotamia, present-day Iraq. It runs near the ancient city of Babylon. Now, we know from the earlier bowl judgments that all the rivers of the earth have been turned to blood, right? So this one must also have been turned to blood, okay? 
And the fact that it says that the water was dried up, don't let that make you think we're dealing with a contradiction or there's some confusion here. Blood is mostly water, all right? Mostly water. So the point of this is not to get technical or scientific. The point of this is to say what was once an impassable river of blood is now dry as a result of this. And as a result now, that river is no longer filled with water or with anything, okay? It's not like what I show you there. So how is that a judgment? Why is that considered a bold judgment? Well, in verse 12, we're told why. It's to make possible a way for the kings of the east. Now, any reference to a king at this point, at this time in history, has to be a reference to one of those seven guys who originally had power before he came along, the Antichrist, when there was 10 of them. Now there's only seven. Now they've you know, all fallen in line underneath him. Those are the only kings we know of that would exist in that day. So it appears as though when it says that uh, these kings are now called from the east, we're talking about the leaders that have worked with the Antichrist to establish this new government and are under his authority. Why are they all in the east? Well, the indication is they're all in the capital city. They're all in the, in the place that the Antichrist has decided to call his home. We know from Daniel that, the, that these kings would rule with this man all the way to the end. And so when verse 12 says that this judgment prepares a way for these kings, the suggestion is that it's a way of letting them travel. Well, that would mean that this water, of, or this river, rather, of blood had been an impediment to them for travel. And so now the Lord is drying up the river so that they can travel uh, to go where the Lord apparently wants them to go. The question is, why does he want them to travel? And how does opening the opportunity for travel constitute a judgment of any significance? Well, in verses 13 through 16, we get to see how this movement plays a part in the judgment. It says the dragon and the beast and the false prophet, once they see the river dried up, they see an opportunity. And they enact a plan. They send out unclean spirits as messengers to these kings. Now, an unclean spirit is a demon. It makes sense that Satan would be using demons, right, as messengers. Uh, John says they're like frogs. I think that's because in the Old Testament, a frog was a symbol of an, old, uh, of an unclean spirit. A frog is an unclean animal, but it's often used as a symbol of, of, a, of a demon. So the demons call the seven kings of the earth. They gather their military forces, and, here, and they're sent to a place that in Hebrew is Har Megiddo. The word Har in Hebrew is the name for hill, and Megiddo is the name of a city in northern Israel. It's a ruin today. You can go visit it in the Jezreel Valley. This is the Jezreel Valley. This is a picture taken from the top of Mount Carmel, which is looking uh, roughly east-northeast. Actually, that's southeast. And if you were to, you can't see it very well, but right here in the distance is Megiddo. And so Megiddo is one of a series of hills that surround the valley of Jezreel. It's a very wide, open, flat area in northern Israel. And that valley is where they're all going. They're not going to the little hill that's next to the valley. They're just going to the valley, but the hill is sort of the reference point. Megiddo is the little town. It, it had, historically, it had been a, a, a place that Solomon set up to guard the pass into the Jezreel Valley. So it's a fortified location. But they're all going into that valley. We'll learn a lot more about this later. So Har Megiddo, Har Megiddo is the hill of Megiddo, or, Megiddo, or Tel Megiddo. And when you transliterate that from Hebrew into English, people start saying Armageddon, Armageddon. So the word Armageddon comes from Har Megiddo. This is the location that the kings will move to in response to the call of the demons once that judgment has dried up the river. So what we're saying is this, that out in the east, uh, there is a location in which these men have headquartered and had their forces. It has to be east of the river, otherwise the river wouldn't have been an impediment to, to get to the Jezreel Valley. So Babylon being on the east side of that river, we learn later in future chapters that it is in fact at Babylon that they are uh, headquartered. And as these five first judgments come to the earth, the ones we've already studied, life now has become unlivable. And not just unlivable, think of it in human terms this way. Just as when Satan was cast down from heaven, he knew his time was short. Once the earth has no more water, time is short. At that point, you've got nothing to lose. You're about to die. Uh, the whole world is about to die. And 
In the midst of that, Satan and the world with him realizes they've got to do something desperate. God has put them in a position for them to act out of desperation. And what Satan does through the Antichrist and the false prophet is send messages to the kings and their forces, essentially all that's left of their army and who they are on earth. And I would assume the message includes something of a, hey guys, look at our situation. We don't have much time left. We need to do something here. And I would assume what Satan proposes is that if the forces of, of the Antichrist marshal themselves and mass in Israel and attack in Jerusalem, they can be prepared to destroy the Christ, to destroy Jesus at his second coming. So they're preparing for the battle, as we heard here, of the great war of the God Almighty. They have decided they're going to take the war to God as opposed to waiting for him to come back. And they look at the state of the world and they conclude, we don't have a lot of time. So they, and that was God's intent. So he puts them in a time pressure, under time pressure. They begin to respond as he expects and they begin to move to where they know his return will happen at the Mount of Olives, according to scripture, and at the return of Christ to Jerusalem. Moreover, there's another aspect to this. The enemy is going to target the remaining Jews that are holding out in the city of Jerusalem, hoping that if he could destroy all of them, then Christ's reason to come back wouldn't exist. We'll talk more about that later. So here's how the war, here's how they move. They come from Babylon. I assume they follow the Fertile Crescent. Traditionally, that's what people do. You don't drive across the desert. And they end up in this northern area of Jerusalem, in the Jezreel Valley. Ironically, we talk about the War of Armageddon, of Armageddon, but there's actually no fighting in that area. That's just an area of massing of forces before they move down to Jerusalem, where the actual battle happens. This is just a wide enough valley that you can put a bunch of people and a bunch of armament. And so the first stage of the war, stage one, which is created out of the first six bowl judgments, the first five give urgency and incentive, and then the sixth gives opportunity by drying up the river. That stage one involves the movement of the Antichrist forces out of his capital city toward Israel, massing them in an attempt to hold off or destroy the return of Christ. But what they've actually done is they've put themselves all in one place so that Jesus can destroy them all at one time. Now, as I said, we haven't heard the name of his capital yet in the text, but we'll hear it soon enough. It's on the chapters to come. It is Babylon. And Babylon itself becomes a major topic as we move into the rest of this study. That, in other words, in verse 15, if you notice there at the end, the Lord inserts that parenthetical statement to the believer who lives during these, these difficult times. In, it's similar to the statement he makes in Revelation 3 to Laodicea when he warns that church, he says, I'm coming like a thief. He says to them, though, you're, you need to be ready for my return for the church, which we know is the rapture. Here, Jesus is talking to those who are on the earth, but it's from the same general perspective. That is, here he's saying, you better be ready for my second coming, because it's about to happen. When you see these events happening, it's about to happen. This is your last chance. So just as the, the unbeliever in the church today will not recognize who the Lord is, and he will not, she will not be taken by the rapture. Similarly, the unbeliever in that day will not recognize that the second coming of Christ is right about to happen, and they will not be ready for that moment either. All right, that's the end of our study tonight. When we come back uh, one more week before the break, we'll, do, uh, we'll move into the next stages of this battle, moving into chapter 19 ultimately. But chapters 17 and 18 are two chapters talking about the destruction of something called Babylon. And it's an in-depth discussion that involves a lot of detail, a lot of things from the Old Testament, which we'll get into. So uh, that's next week. Come back, stay up on the study. There's a lot going on in the next several weeks I don't want you to miss. And then as we get with, to 19 and beyond, just so you know, we get into Christ's second coming, we'll start looking at the kingdom. And we'll do something I call Kingdom 101. We'll go through an overview of what the kingdom will be like. That's part of this study as well. All right, let's pray. And if we have time for you, if you want to stay, we'll do Q&A. Father, uh, we just put our minds on prayer and on you and on your presence in the heavenly throne room and on Christ interceding for us. And we just thank you for those things. We thank you that there is intercession at all times for the sin that is continually a part of us right now, Father. And we thank you that that access has not closed and will not close for us. And we thank you, Father, that a day comes when we join you in that place. And Father, we thank you that we are not to experience wrath. And Lord, 
Help us to understand these things from that point of view so that we will not take liberty or license with our grace, the, with, that, with the salvation we've received, that we would be conscious of uh, so great a salvation requires obedience. Help us to live according to what you've done for us, Father. And help us to tell others what we've learned. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.